Andrew Womack Ministries presents part two in Don't Limit God, a six-part series. This teaching by Andrew is titled, Cares of This World. We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. Today I'm beginning my second teaching through Don't Limit God. And I tell you, when God spoke to me and told me that I was limiting Him by my small thinking, it was one of the most important uh, encounters with the Lord that I've ever had. It has transformed my life. Many times we think that God just sovereignly controls things and we don't have any control. God has delegated control to us. Your life is going the way that you are directing it. And I know some of you may take offense at that and think, oh, I've had tragedy happen and I did not do this. You may not have, like say for instance, just prayed and said, oh God, make me have cancer. But you have thought in ways that allowed that cancer to dominate you, such as thinking that you're only human and that, you know, cancer is incurable. Those thoughts are contrary to what God's Word says. All things are possible to him that believes. But if you exalt what the world says and if you go by other people and what they're experiencing, that limits what God can do in your life. God has promised us divine health, not only divine healing, that you can be healed of whatever, but you can get to a place where no plague will come nigh your dwelling. But see, most people are limiting God without even realizing it because instead of letting the Word of God be our standard and going by what the Word says, we look at this world and we kind of take an average of what everybody else is experiencing and think, well, this is probably the way that my life will go. Your life doesn't have to go that way. In Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 34, verse 7, somewhere anyway, but it says that Moses was 120 years old and his natural force wasn't abated nor his eyesight dim. If Moses could walk and climb a mountain the day that the Lord took him, he climbed a mountain at 120 years old. He wasn't feeble. His eyesight wasn't dim. If that happened for Moses, that should be the standard. But right now, there's people all around the world who are hearing me say this. You know that the Scripture says it, but nonetheless, your standard is, well, your parents were like this. They died when they were 60, 70, or 80, or whatever. Dear old Aunt Susie, she lost her mind. And this is kind of what you're expecting. Did you know that that kind of thinking limits what God can do in your life? Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Whether you understand this or not, your life is going the direction of your thoughts. And again, you may not think, well, I didn't, I didn't think about cancer. It was the farthest thing from my mind. But no, your thoughts limited you to just being a natural man or a woman. You know, this song that I made fun of many times, it's a catchy tune, but it says, Lord, I'm only human. I'm just a man. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. A catchy tune, but those lyrics will kill you because you are not just a man or a woman. You are God-possessed. You have God Almighty living on the inside of you, and you should expect more than people that don't know God. So what if the flu's going around and everybody else is getting it? That, it says no plague will come nigh your dwelling. I was just recently in Phoenix, Arizona, and a woman came up and greeted me, and I stuck out my hand to shake hands with her, and she says, oh, I can't touch you. I, I've got the flu. And I said, the flu's not going to bother me. And I just reached out and grabbed her hand and shook hands with her. And I said, no germ's going to touch my body and live. And I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird when the Bible says that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. A thousand will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Again, that's what the Bible promises. That's what's available. But see, very few people are shooting for God's best. They are willing to settle for less. And so they just expect to catch the flu. They expect to have a cold once a year. They expect for their eyesight to get bad. They expect this is the way it happens with everybody else. You know, here's a verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Did you know that this is what people do? Again, they look around 
And well, the average person lives to be 70 or maybe 80, and so they just expect that's what it's going to be. But the Bible says in Psalms chapter 91 that with long life will He satisfy you and show you His salvation. God will satisfy you. If you aren't satisfied at 70, if you aren't satisfied at 80, go for another lap. With long life will He satisfy you. And again, if Moses could live to be 120, well, then why can't we do it? We've got a superior covenant. And I know some of you are thinking, yeah, you, you can't think that way. Don't wake me up. It's how I'm thinking. And you know what? In the last 45 years, I've had two times where I dealt with sickness, and it wasn't because I got sick. It was because I just uh, depleted myself. Ministered 40 times one week and 41 times the next week. Got so tired, I literally had to crawl. I couldn't walk. I had to crawl and get in bed. And it was just, it was exhaustion more than it was sickness. And that was stupidity. That wasn't sickness. And I've had to learn, and I, you know, I've had to make some adjustments, but I don't get sick. And I'm telling you, you don't have to live sick. You don't have to be poor. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be defeated. God has provided something better, but most people are comparing themselves with others and just thinking, well, this is going to be my lot. Whether you realize it or not, that thinking limits what God can do because Proverbs 23, 7, as you think in your heart, that's the way it's going to be. Even though God has provided long life, no plague will come nigh your dwelling. He's given you all of these great things. It's not going to happen automatically. It isn't going to happen sovereignly without your cooperation. You have to take these limits off God. You have to begin to start believing what the Word says instead of what dear old Aunt Susie said. You need to quit going by what the doctors say, that you've got these genes. Did you know my dad died when he was 54 years old? He actually died 12 years before that when he was only 42, and he was raised from the dead. He had a human artery transplant from his heart all the way to his knee. And Dr. DeBakey in Houston, famous surgeon, operated on him. I think he was, I forget the exact number, 20 or 30, 40, 40th person that had had this transplant, and my dad is the first person that ever lived through it. And he did die, but he was raised from the dead on a stretcher out in the hall. As they were taking him to the morgue, he came back to life because our Baptist pastor was having a prayer meeting, and they prayed, and he came back to life. But he lived for 12 more years until he died at 54. And um, he had sickness. He was on special diet. He always had to... Uh, you know, being a, a recliner, even at work, he had a recliner at work when he came home. He never, you know, played any games with me and stuff. And there's no criticism on my part. He was an, unable to do it. But I'm just saying he was, he was semi-invalid, um, you know, during that period of time. And then he died at 54. So every time I've had to go get an insurance exam or anything and they find out your history, has anybody ever had heart problems, they always go to saying, well, then, man, you have this gene and you are predisposed to having heart problems and all of these things that your dad had. I always ask him, I said, why don't you go by my mother who lived to be 96 years old and her heart was as healthy as a horse? There was no problem. How come they always look at the worst case scenario? But see, people will say things like that and there are some of you that say, well, cancer runs in the family, heart disease runs in the family, Alzheimer's runs in the family. And we, if you think that way and think, well, I'm only human, well, then you know what? You're limiting God by your small thinking. You are comparing yourself with other people that don't know God. There should be a difference between us and people that don't know God. And I'm talking about even Christians that may be born again, but they don't know the Word of God and they aren't walking in the Word of God. We need to think differently. You need to expect differently. Did you know there's a lot of aspects to faith, but one of the aspects to faith is expectation. If you are expecting bad things, then you aren't in faith. If you are in faith, it changes your expectation. And there are some of you that are expecting to have the same results that your parents, that your siblings had, that your relatives had, that what you hear on television. That's what you expect because that's what you hear and that limits God. Man, this is powerful.
This is amazing, the things that I'm saying. I could just continue to say that in a thousand different ways because the vast majority of people are limiting God and aren't even aware of it. They are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. Let me share this verse with you out of Mark chapter 4. This is the parable of the sower sowing the seed. And then Jesus gave an interpretation. There was four different types of ground. And the third type of ground where the seed was sown, it was an incorruptible seed is what it says in 1 Peter 1.23. So the seed wasn't the problem. And yet the seed only produced fruit in one out of four people. Only 25% of the people that the seed was sown into actually saw the Word of God work. Not because the Word was the problem, it was the ground. It was their own heart that was the problem. And this is just another way of saying what I've been saying, that God has great plans for every one of you. He's got seeds that He wants to grow in your life, but it's not just up to God. It's the condition of your heart whether you are believing God, whether you're taking the limits off of God, or whether you're limiting Him by your small thinking. So that's what this parable is about. And in verse 18, the third type of ground, it says, These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Again, God's Word is an incorruptible seed. And let me just put a little spin on this, uh, and it's absolutely true, the same things I'm saying. But let me say that God's plans for you, His purpose for your life is incorruptible. God is not going to change. It says in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, that the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God had a purpose for you when He created you. And... I could spend literally weeks on this, but God didn't create any of us to be failures. God never created anybody, and your destiny was to be a drunk, to be a drug addict, to have your life just destroyed, for you to live a life of depression and sickness and failure and go out with a whimper. That God didn't create us that way. God has a plan for your life. But whether it comes to pass or not is not dependent upon God. God's plan for you is incorruptible. And as it says in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. You may have gotten way off track. You may have done things your own way and you may find yourself over here in a position where you know this isn't God's will for you and you may think, well, I just ruined it. There's no way back. But the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. That means God never takes it back. I don't care how bad you've messed up. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what kind of a failure you are. It doesn't matter how discouraged you've been. It doesn't matter what has happened. God's plans for you have not changed. And God is at least as good as a GPS system. Of course, that's a, a sarcastic statement. He's perfect. But I'm saying these GPS systems... You make a wrong turn, you know, it just says recalculating. And it, it doesn't matter how you turn, it doesn't matter where you go, that thing has a way to plot you a course to get back on track. God is at least that good. It doesn't matter how you've messed your life up. It doesn't, make if you, it doesn't matter if you've made a wrong turn. It doesn't matter if you've made a U-turn and are going in the opposite direction. God can plot a course from wherever you find yourself right now back into the center of His will. And it can be so good that you'll wonder how it could have been better. You know, Moses is an example of this. Moses failed God big time. He killed an Egyptian thinking that he was bringing God's will to pass. And that wasn't the way God was going to do it. And because of this, Moses had to flee from Pharaoh. And he spent 40 years in the wilderness learning how to do things God's way instead of his way. But... Even though, you know, Moses was in this position where he was probably the second or third uh, most important man in all of Egypt. He had this position of authority. Secular accounts that I've read in commentaries say that Moses was a mighty general that went and conquered the Ethiopians and brought in the greatest spoil to Egypt of any general that they had ever had. He was this powerful, influential man. It looked easy 
that God could use him to bring deliverance to the Jews. But he tried to do it his way instead of God's way. And because of it, he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert herding sheep. And most people would think, well, boy, you blew it. Your chance was over. You'll never see it happen now. And yet God was able to plot a course and get Moses back into the center of his will. And of course, Moses became this, this figure in, in biblical history that I, there's just nobody that compares to him under the old covenant. I mean, Moses saw things happen. It was phenomenal. And he spent time 80 days in the presence of the Lord without eating or drinking anything. And his face shone and God spoke to him in an audible voice and on and on and on. You could go all of the things that happened. This man who failed so miserably was able to get back in the center of God's will. And so I'm just saying that God has a purpose for all of you. And it wasn't failure. It wasn't mediocre, mediocrity. God has a powerful plan for every single person. And whether you have seen it or not, regardless of whether you've rebelled and go the other direction, God can still get you back on track because the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. But it starts with you. It starts with you taking the limits off in your heart. When the Lord spoke to me January the 31st, 2002 and told me I was limiting God, there was many ways I was limiting. I'm going to talk about a lot of this, but one of them I was uh, just, you know, thinking that finances, income was hard to come by. I was thinking small. I was expecting small. But when God spoke to me, I took the limits off. I began to believe God for lots of money. And did you know it took about two months for me to come up with a way of saying these things and putting it in a letter to send to our partners. And by the time that my staff had proofed the letter, had printed the letter, had mailed the letter, and it got out, it was about two months after this experience and so it, for two months, nobody heard from me. It wasn't anything I said that occasioned this. But when I made the change in my heart and said, I'm going to take the limits off God and I will have the finances that I need to do whatever God calls me to do. When I made that decision before I told people, before there was anything in the natural, did you know our income nearly doubled? We had the largest February and the largest March income that we had ever had up until that time. I mean, it was just like, I've said it this way before, that it was like God was sending me all of the supply that I needed, but there was a dam that was holding it up. That dam was my small thinking. Through my small thinking, I was hindering the flow. And when I changed the way I thought, it's like this spiritual dam just broke and the supply started coming in before I could do anything in the natural to make it happen before I could let my partners know, before I could go on television and talk about these things, before all of that, the finances started. So here's my point that, you know what? It's not just in the natural, you've got to do something. It starts in the spiritual. It starts with your attitude. It starts, as I was saying, with Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. There is something that I don't have the ability to describe it properly, but your thinking, your attitude affects your altitude. It affects what can happen in the physical realm. It's not the physical realm that changes and makes you think a certain way. It's the way you think that reflects itself in what's going on in your life. And see, that's not the way that most people think. Most people are praying, oh, God, heal me. And they're asking God to just somehow or another supernaturally touch them, send somebody that waves their hand over them or give the doctors a special cure or show me something. And they're looking for something from the outside. But healing starts on the inside. As you think in your heart, so are you. You get healed on the outside, and I guarantee you, your body will be healed on the... Excuse me, I think I said that wrong. You get healed on the inside and your body will be healed on the outside. Instead of you just waiting to win the lottery and praying that somebody just come and give you all of this money and stuff, you get prosperous on the inside. You see yourself prospering. And you change that attitude on the inside and it's just a matter of time until you will see it reflected on the outside. 
See, that's what I'm testifying to, that our income nearly doubled when I changed my attitude for two months before I was able to tell anybody about it and before I did anything to occasion our partners to respond and start giving. Our income just went up supernaturally and it was directly related to the way I thought. You know, another thing that happened was that I had gone on television in January of 2000 and we had increased and we had been on a number of individual stations, one network and some other things, but it was slow the way things were going. And uh, I had been on the Daystar television network as a guest probably four or five times. And Marcus and Joni Lamb, I knew them. They were friends with me and I had spoken and we had a good relationship. And yet I had asked them to go on their network many times, and I don't know, for whatever reason, it just never worked. We, they actually sent us a rate card one time when we asked about buying time on their network, and it was higher, or excuse me, I said that wrong. They, we asked them, and they told us that we could go on for this amount of money, and it was higher than their published rate card. It was like they didn't want us on there, and I've mentioned this to Marcus, and Marcus doesn't understand how this happened. It was probably somebody working in their organization. But for whatever reason, for two years, I had been asking Daystar to go on and nothing happened. Then I changed my attitude and I told my staff, I said, I don't know how long it takes to change this image on the inside, but I will do this. I am going on all of these networks. Things are working out. And when I began to speak that and change my attitude, we didn't go back to them. I didn't talk to them, but within two days, of me making that decision. I got a letter from Marcus Lamb. And he says, why aren't you on Daystar? He says, I don't know what the problem is, but he says, you send us the programs. Your program will start airing on Monday and we will work out the finances. I guarantee you we will make it so it'll work for you. And within two days of me changing my attitude, something I had been trying for for two years came to pass. Not because I knocked on their door again, not because I made a new deal, it was something in the spiritual realm. It changed. And I'm telling you, the same thing's going to happen for you. Stinking thinking is our problem. And you've got to quit limiting God by thinking small. We need to believe God big. Boy, God is awesome. God is huge. And we make a mistake when we compare ourselves with other people and what other people have done. And relative to other people, you may be doing good, but relative to what God called you to do, I can guarantee you there is more for every single person. You are never going to max God out. You're never going to totally, ex, you know, just expend all of the energy that God has for you in your lifetime. Every one of us are going to leave this life with things unaccomplished because God's plans for us are just huge. And I really want to make this point that it's obvious to some people whose life is way off track that you've messed up God's plan for your life and you need to quit limiting Him. You need to go back and cooperate. But there are some of you that are in a good place and relative to maybe your past history, relative to what your family has done, relative to friends or something, you may feel like you're doing just great. But I'm just telling you in the name of the Lord, thus saith the Lord, relative to what God's plans are for you, you've still got a long ways to go. There is more. Nobody has seen everything that God wants come to pass in their life. God is just so big that we just cannot fully represent Him. Now, I believe that we can do the best we can and God is pleased with us. I'm not saying that He's displeased, but I'm saying that, man, there is room for every one of us to grow and to reach further. And so here are some of the reasons that I was limiting God. In Mark chapter 4, verse 18, talking about the parable of the sower sowing the seed, it says, These are they which are sown among thorns. Talking about the Word of God, this incorruptible seed was sown among thorns, such as hear the Word, and the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Here in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered and many such like things do ye. So Jesus said that our traditions 
and you could say this in many different ways, but our thinking, our values, our focus, our a lot of things, they hinder the Word of God. They make the Word of God of none effect. And one of the reasons that I was limiting God, this is what God spoke to me in 2002. One of the ways that I was limiting God was just what I call laziness. Not everybody talks to themselves this way, but I'm just super blunt with people and with myself. Some of you might say that you were just comfortable, that you were enjoying life or whatever, but the bottom line for me is it was just laziness. You know, I was called into the ministry in 1968 and I started ministering immediately. I pastored three little churches. The largest church we ever had was a hundred. Uh, I had gone on radio and we were pushing and I mean, I, I could spend long periods of time trying to explain to you, but it was a struggle. Every time we went on a new radio station, man, I was pushing the envelope. We were on the verge of disaster financially and we just struggled, struggled, struggled and we had grown People's lives were being changed. I had seen people saved, born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. We had seen people raised from the dead. I was seeing fruit in my ministry, but it seemed like it came with a lot of struggle. And then on July the 26th, 1999, after I'd already made the decision to go on television and we were going to start in January the 3rd of 2000 was my first television broadcast. And after I'd made this decision, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and told me, you are just now getting started. He says, the time has come. And I said, the time for what? It's a long story, but he told me the time for your ministry to start. He told me that if I would have died or somehow or another quit the ministry before I started on television, January the 3rd, 2000, that I would have missed God's will for my life. That I everything up until that time had been preparation. 32 years of being in the ministry was all preparation. And the reason I say that is to give you a little background. And when we started on television, it's just like somebody opened up the floodgates. Finances began to come in. The response grew. People were responding. It was just phenomenal. It was drastically different than when I had been on radio for 20-something years. And I mean, it was awesome. And so I say all of this to say that we were in a position where we were reaching more people than we ever had. We had more money in the bank than we had ever had. Things were going good. People's lives were being changed. And you know what? I was just, I got lazy because for 32 years, it was like a struggle. It was like, you know, swimming and you, you, it took all of the energy you had to keep your nose above the water line. And if you rested for just a second, you'd sink. You could drown. And that's the way I lived for 32 years. But then when I hit that sweet spot, when God finally told me, you're just now starting your ministry, everything began to work. People were responding. We were having greater response, greater finances. And I was enjoying it. And I was enjoying not having the pressure that I had lived under for 32 years. And you know what it was? It's like this is saying, it was the cares of this world. I just got to enjoying not being under the gun. And I had become lazy. And I didn't want to stretch again. I didn't want to put myself in a position where there could be possible failure. And so you could say this in different ways and apply it to your situation, but for me, the Lord just told me, he says, you've, you've become lazy. You're just enjoying the ease of things. You aren't stretching yourself. And you know, something I've seen in the Word of God and God has taught me many times that man, He is just, He constantly is leading us to do more. There's more. We, we never obtain everything. There is never a place that you can just, you know, coast and turn off the engine and just coast. It's like flying in an airplane. You turn off that engine and you may stay aloft for a period of time, but the moment you quit applying that power, gravity is still there and it's going to start pulling you down. And sad to say, there's a lot of people that, you know, they put out a lot of effort and they obtain things to a certain degree, but then when they reach to where it's like, now we can breathe easy, now we can retire, now we can take it easy, and they just start coasting. And the moment you do, you start heading down. You know, my own mother, I re she was just a beautiful woman. When she was in her 60s, when she retired at 65, 
I had one of my friends, we were driving down the road, and uh, one of my friends whistled at her. She was a beautiful woman. And I said, that's my mother. <laughs> and she looked like she was in her 30s or 40s when she was 65. But did you know when she retired and no longer had a purpose, she was a supervisor in the school system, and when she no longer had a purpose for every day, but she was going to these little garden parties and doing things like that, my mother aged 10 years in two years' time after she retired. I mean, it took a toll on her. I've seen a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people. I have seen people that were just doing great, and when they retire within a very short period of time, they start having health problems, and all kinds of things happen. I'm telling you, you need a purpose. You need something that drives you, something that you need to get up in the morning. And yet, the average person is working hard for a place when they can retire. And if they could take early retirement, if they could retire at 45 or 50, man, go for it. That's what most people think. And then they just start coasting. I'm not saying that you don't take early retirement, but if you if you made so much money you could take an early retirement, well then start into a second career or start volunteering and start helping somebody else, but you need a purpose for your life. And the moment you just start taking it easy and you, all you want to do is go play golf all day or you want to do something. And again, I'm not against golf. I play golf. I haven't in the last year I've been too busy, but I have played golf in the past. I'm not against golf or, or, you know, taking it easier or taking a vacation. I'm not saying that you need to be a workaholic. One of the things that allows you to have longevity is that you need to pace yourself. You need to have some fun along the way. I agree with all of those things, but you need to have a purpose. You know, over this last Christmas season, we had my kids come out, my granddaughter. We had Jamie's sister and nephew come and... You know, I enjoyed being with family and we had a good time and everything was good. But man, when they left and we started back into school and I started back into making television programs and traveling and ministering, I just was so excited. I thought, man, this is, this is what, what I'm made for. I enjoyed the time off. I enjoyed it. It's not that there was bad. I think it's good to take those times, but I'm telling you, I love what I'm doing. I've heard people say that when you are doing what you love to do, it's not ever a day of work. And that's the way that I feel. Man, I love doing what God called me to do. I have a purpose. And it's not just, you know, I'm approaching 69. And you know what? I've got more purpose, more direction, more excitement, more motivation for doing what God has called me to do than I have ever had in my life. And it's not going to change. If I live to be 100, I guarantee you I'm going to have a purpose. If I'm still breathing, God's got a reason for leaving me here on this earth. And I'm always going to be pushing for something. I'm just saying, you can't take it easy. You can't let the cares of this world, you can't just get to where you're just coasting, where you're just sitting back and drinking Kool-Aid and doing nothing. God didn't make us to do that. And yet this is what a lot of people are shooting for. They're working hard right now. They are putting in to a 401k. They're preparing for their retirement. They're doing all of this. And then they just retire and lose their purpose. And the moment you do that, it hurts you emotionally. It hurts you physically. You need a purpose. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be working an 8-to-5 job. And if you've made enough money that you could retire, do it. But, you know, I've got friends that are in a situation where they've got a motor home. And what they do, they travel around and they're seeing the, the United States, which is great. They wanted to do it. But you know what? They actually feel that God is sending them to these uh, campsites and to people. And they are looking for people and they have a purpose and they are still out preaching the gospel and reaching people. There was a couple that actually ran one of our schools that they reached early retirement. And they had a beautiful home and they were walking down a road on a beautiful day and they were holding hands and they had done the same thing every day. They took their walk at the same time and they both looked at each other and says, is this all that there is? They had money. They had family. They had health. Everything was good. But is this all that there is? It's just sitting here doing nothing and just enjoying the day. Now, again, you need to enjoy the day, and I'm not saying that you, you don't smell the roses and the flowers as you're passing through, but 
They just said, there's got to be more than this, and they decided to come to school. And, you know, in their retirement years, they left everything, sold their dream home. They came to school, and in school, they got fired up. They realized that, man, there was more that God wanted to use them, and they left school and have been running one of our extension schools now for, I forget how what period of time, maybe 10 years, seeing hundreds, thousands of people's lives change. People just set free. Their life has taken on meaning. They are doing more in their retirement years than they have ever done in their life before. I'm telling you, you can't let just this desire to just take it easy, to sit back and enjoy life and get occupied with the cares of this life. It will choke the Word of God. That's exactly what this is saying. And there's a lot of people that just being too involved in this life can limit what God wants to do in your life. Now, again, there's a balance. I'm not saying you don't enjoy things. You know, I went to a time management deal one time. This has been 30-something years ago. And they had us make out a schedule of what we were going to do. And I put in there an hour and a half every day to exercise. I was running at that time six miles a day. And I wrote that down as part of my schedule. And anyway, we had to share this with the whole class. And when I shared that, there were some people that actually laughed like, boy, this isn't good time management. You're going to spend an hour and a half every day exercising. And anyway, the woman who was leading the class, she took that as an example. And she said, this is a great example. If you don't spend some time taking care of your body and exercising, you aren't going to last long enough to accomplish all your goals. And she said, this is very good to put time in to exercise. Likewise, it's very good to put time in and take some time off and, and, you know, smell the roses as you pass through. I'm not saying that we don't enjoy life, but overall, you can't just reach a place to where you've retired and there is no point for your existence. If all you're doing is, occup you know, just doing nothing and just sitting there and waiting on your time to go home to be with the Lord, well, then you're taking up too much space. You need to be living on the edge or you're taking up too much space. You need to have a purpose in life. And I know that I'm speaking directly to some people right now. I, don't, I may not know you personally, but I know that the Spirit of the Lord is speaking through me. And God is saying He's got more for you. You know, the people that make the very best students in our Bible college are the older people that their families are raised They've got enough income that they don't have to worry about things they're taken care of. They've got life experience. They've learned a lot of things, a lot what not to do, a lot of things to do. Those make some of the best students because, man, when they get here and they get the Word in them, they are now free. They don't have, you know, young children that limit what they can do. They've got enough disposable income that they can do these. And that, that is just a prime time. Actually, some of the greatest students that have gone out and are making the biggest impact are people that are in their retirement years. We actually had one woman graduate from our school who was 89 years old when she graduated. And when she went on her missions trips, I had the other students come back and say, nobody can keep up with her. <laughs> she was running circles around them all. Man, she had energy and stuff. And you know what? Moses was 80 years old before he really found God's will and began to fulfill it. I'm just saying that you cannot get into this mode where you're just going to sit back and coast and do nothing. That was one of the things that was happening with me. I had struggled for 32 years, and we had finally come to a place to where things were going so well, it was like I could coast. And I was enjoying it. And I wasn't looking forward to stretching my faith and believing God for bigger and better things that would put me at risk, and potentially I could fail, and I could be under financial pressure. And, uh, you know, one of the big things was criticism. I was reaching a lot of people, but I wasn't large enough yet that I had a target on me, and I was flying under the radar, and nobody was really criticizing me. And I knew that with increased visibility that I'm going to get increased criticism, and I just didn't want it. And I was just enjoying flying under the radar. And you know what I'd call that is just lazy. And God told me that, man, you are limiting me with this attitude. You know, let me share this verse with you out of um, Ecclesiastes. 
chapter 5. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and in verse 3, it says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. But a dream cometh through the multitude of business. Did you know, I think it's the Amplified that says something about a, a dream comes through a lot of hard work and pain, painful effort or something. I may have misquoted that. But it uses the word pain in there. And did you know that to see a dream come to pass, it's going to take effort on your part. The people who are just thinking that, well, if God wants me to do this, it'll just happen and it'll be effortless. That's not the way that it happens. Now, change is effortless because you plant the Word and it changes your heart. But then to get that dream implemented and see that dream come to pass, I guarantee you it's going to take some effort. If you're just wanting to sit on a couch and be a couch potato and do nothing, then you know what? You are going to limit God. You will not see God's will come to pass in your life. But if, you, if God has given you a dream, if you understand that He has a purpose for your life, a dream is going to come through a much business. It's going to be through a lot of effort. There may even be pain involved in it. Not an ungodly pain that God's going to hurt you and things like this, but it just takes effort. You know, if you're going to win in the Olympics, you can't be like all of your other friends that just go out and party and stuff. You have to go to bed at a certain time. You have to get up. You have to train. You have to discipline yourself. You have to eat a certain way, and you have to deny yourself. There has to be discipline if you're going to win the prize. It's the same thing in the spiritual realm. It's going to take effort on your part. And if you just want to goof off, and if for some hour or another you just think that doing nothing is awesome, and you're looking for a life of ease where you can do nothing and have no purpose and no responsibilities, you're limiting God. Your cares of this life, your care for this life, your care for having it easy will limit God. This is exactly what God spoke to me. I had reached a place where I was limiting God just because I was enjoying coasting. Now, I wasn't out living in sin. I was still traveling. I was still ministering the Word. We were doing daily television. We were putting out materials. But I knew that God had more for me than what I was experiencing, and I just didn't want to stretch myself. I didn't want to run the risk of failure. And I'm telling you, that was limiting God. And it was limiting me from seeing these things and pressing in these areas. It is amazing what God has done. And the good news is that this isn't just for some people. This is for all of us. All of us limit God by our small thinking in all of these things. Let me use this parable that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 19. He said, He said, Therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So there was ten servants, ten pounds. That means each servant got one pound. And then in verse 14 it says, But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called to him, unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. He said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said, Likewise to him, be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin, for I have feared thee, because thou art an austere man, and takest up thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then givest thou not my money unto the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with usury, and he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, that, the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him 
that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken from him. But those whose enemies would not that I should rule over them, bring them hither and slay them before me. There's a lot of things that we can learn out of this passage of Scripture, but one of them is that God has given us talents. Now, you know, you could, you could relate this only to money. You can relate it to a lot of things, but God gave us life. And He didn't give His life to us so that we can just occupy space take up space and go through life and, and draw from everybody else and expect everybody else to minister to us. There's so much that we could teach from this. But what I want to point out is that he expected people to take what he has given them and produce increase with it. And in the context of what I've been talking about, God gave us life. He has a purpose for your life. And your life is meant to be blessed, yes, you know, he told uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Before you can be a blessing, you've got to be blessed. You can't bless others if you aren't blessed. So yes, God wants to bless us individually, but God never wants any of us to be just all like a vacuum cleaner that just sucks everything towards us. It's not all about us. God has a purpose for our life and He wants us to be putting out and to be changing other people's lives. And this is what I've been talking about. God showed me that I was limiting what God could do through me because I was just taking it easy and I just got complacent. You know, let me say this. God wants us to be content. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, I think it's verse 10, verse 11 right there, he says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therein to be content. We need to be content. We need to be appreciative of what we've got. We shouldn't be lusting after other things for ourselves. but God does not want us to be complacent. Just like this parable right here, He has given us gifts and talents. He gave us life. And this true life isn't just about living for yourself. It's not about just working, get you a retirement plan, and then you retire and you just take care of yourself. What really makes life work is when you live for other people. It doesn't, life isn't about what you can get. The great American dream is get all you can, can all you get, and then sit on your can and do nothing. And that is not good. God wants us to prosper. He wants to increase, but He wants to increase us so that we can be a blessing. He blesses us to be a blessing. God has a purpose for your life. And I know that I'm talking to many people right now that you don't live this way. It's all about you. You're thinking about how can you get your house paid for? How can you get the things that you want? You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your kids and you, you know, me, my four and no more. But that's not what life is all about. Yes, God wants to take care of you. Yes, God wants to bless your family. But God wants to flow through you and touch other people. And I'm telling you, we limit God when we don't understand this and we don't have this concept that I am accountable to God for increase. There's many people today that would commend this servant and say, well, he didn't lose a single thing. He gave back to the Lord what he was given. But God, this parable shows that God wants increase. God has given us life. You have the life of God living on the inside. I'm assuming you have a relationship with God, but God doesn't want to just set you free, as important as that is. He wants to flow through you and touch someone else. And I tell you, if you don't live with that, if you don't live like Paul said over in Romans chapter 1, I'm a debtor to people, not only to the Jew, but also to the people that don't know the Lord. He considered himself a debtor. He was in debt, not financially, but in debt. He owed people to get what was in him out and reach other people. You know, I live with a conscience that God has put himself in me. He has taught me his word. He's shown me how the kingdom works. I've been able to see it flow through me to the point that I've seen people raised from the dead Blind eyes open. People come out of wheelchair. I've seen marriages put together. I've seen great things happen. And God has put these things in me and I am a debtor to get this out. If I don't fulfill God's purpose for my life, there are people that God has ordained me to be the vessel through whom He reaches them. And if I don't do my part, 
there's other people that are going to miss their miracle that they're praying for. Inside of me is the answer for some people. I'm not the answer for everybody. I'm not everybody's answer, but there are people that God has ordained me to reach, and I've got to do my part. And the same is true of you. You've got to recognize that God has more for you than what you've experienced. And I don't care who you are, where you are, what you've done, there is more, and we need to increase. Now, notice that the Lord took the man who had produced 10 pounds out of his one pound, and he gave him 10 cities. But the man who had only produced five pounds, the Lord also commended him and gave him five cities. He gave him responsibility according to the way that he had managed what God had given him. But he didn't rebuke him and say, why didn't you get 10? You know, we all have different things. Not everybody's called to do what I'm do, doing. But you are called to reach out. You know, there's a friend of mine, a lady that was in one of our Bible studies and this woman was just a housewife. But you know what? In her area, she witnessed to everybody. She made an impact. People know this woman everywhere. Matter of fact, anyway, I won't go into all the details, but she's made a worldwide impact. She's made some inventions that have been shown on Shark Tank, and God is using her. But I remember that her, um, her, grand, her mother or grandmother, I forget now, it's been a long time, but anyway, they died. And she got her sisters together and they went over there and raised her mother from the dead. And her mother got up after being dead and walked two miles into town and went grocery shopping and came back. <laughs> and I tell you, God didn't call her to do what he called me to do, but in her world, she's impacting her world by believing and standing on the Word of God. And every one of us. You know, I spend millions and millions of dollars on television and radio airtime. And yet I can guarantee you that every person, there is somebody under your influence that has never heard of me, that will never hear of me if I spent 10 times as much money as I'm spending now. You have a realm of influence. There are people watching you that will never watch me. And if you don't get this attitude that the Lord was commending here to where you take what God has given you and you get beyond yourself, it's not just about you. But you've got to go beyond yourself and start reaching out to other people. If you don't live with that kind of an attitude, you're limiting God. Man, that's an amazing statement. You know, here's what the dictionary defines limit as. It says to confine or restrict within limits. You know, there's a lot of things that do this. Doctrines of men do this. Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said that your doctrines and traditions are making the Word of God of none effect. You know, I was raised in the Baptist church, and I'm not against the Baptists. I got born again there. They taught salvation. I praise God for the Baptist church. But the Baptist church also taught that miracles passed away, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and miracles today aren't for us. And did you know because of that, we didn't experience miracles. My dad, he died when I had just turned 12 years old. He was the chairman of the deacons. He loved God. But we were taught that miracles don't happen today. We weren't taught the Word of God. The Bible says, Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And did you know that through our ignorance, we limited what God could do? It was not God's will that I grow up through my teenage years without a father. It wasn't God's will that my dad was basically sick the whole time of, of my life and that we didn't get to do things together. That wasn't God's will. God had better plans for us, but we limited God because of the ignorance that was within us. It wasn't rebellion. It wasn't mean-spirited. My dad loved the Lord. He led people to the Lord. He was a godly man, but he did not know what the Word of God says. Faith comes by hearing the Word, and since he didn't hear the Word, he didn't have faith. He died prematurely. It affected our family. Praise God, I turned to the Lord through this, but you know, it was a hardship on my mother and my brother and my sister. And we didn't experience God's best because of ignorance, lack of knowing the Word of God. That limits God. We've got to get beyond that. The Bible says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, I believe it is, it says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Maybe you're surviving, but you're struggling. You aren't enjoying the abundant life that you could. 
and you're want, you may pray and ask God to heal you, but the Word of God teaches that God has already put His power on the inside of us. It's not God's turn to heal you. It's your turn to find out what you've already got. Take your authority, and it says you resist the devil, and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. He told you to go heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. He didn't tell you to pray and ask God to heal him. He told you to heal him. Peter said this in Acts chapter 3. He says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he reached out and grabbed this man by the hand and lifted him up, and his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he went walking and leaping and praising God. He didn't even pray and ask God to heal him. He healed him. The Lord said, You heal the sick. I know what I'm saying is radical, and some of you think, oh, man, I've never heard this before. That's the reason that you limit God through ignorance, not necessarily through rebellion or your intentional in it, but what we don't know is killing us. We limit God through our ignorance. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. I've seen a bumper sticker that says, you know, what you don't know won't hurt you. That's not true. What you don't know is killing you. There are people watching this program that you're either fighting sickness, you've had people die around you, you aren't prospering in business because you don't understand it's God's will for you to prosper. There are some people, even as I say this, I've, had, I've heard people on radio programs call me by name and brand me as a health wealth preacher which I don't know where they came up with this, but, you know, I'd rather be a health wealth preacher than a sickness poverty preacher. <laughs> but there's people that have been taught that you shouldn't have money. Matter of fact, one of these guys who called me out on radio, I heard on a Christian radio program that he had just dedicated his house, and I forget the figures now, but it was a multi-million dollar house with an Olympic-sized indoor swimming pool in his house, and he's calling me out for being a health wealth preacher. I live in a house that costs $60,000. Now, I've remodeled it, and I've done some things. It's worth more than that, but I'm saying that's what I paid for my house, and he's sitting here criticizing me. I believe in prosperity, but I'm not using it so that I can just have an expensive house and drive fancy cars. I'm using it so that I can preach the gospel. There's people that will sit there and say, but you know, I just have enough. I don't have very much, but I've got enough. I'm getting by. I just wouldn't ask God for any more. I think that's greedy. No, you know what's greedy is when you get enough, forget the rest of the world and you just sit there and take care of yourself, and you aren't going to believe God for extra. If you've got everything you, you need, believe God for more and give it to me so that I can accomplish God's will and, and preach the gospel and do the things that God has called me to do. That attitude about I've got enough and I wouldn't ask God for any more, that is a selfish attitude. <laughs> Amen. I know what I'm saying is strange to a lot of people, but this is, this is the reason that we limit God and that we don't see His best is because we have taken these doctrines of men, these traditions, and we have lowered our expectations and we're looking for nothing. We're like this man in this parable that just has one little talent and we keep it hidden in a napkin and we don't share with anybody. We don't take what God has given us and use it to bless anybody and we just return it to Him. When we get through with this life, we're going to say, God, here I am. And He's going to say, what did you do with your life? Did you bless anybody else? Oh, no, I stayed to myself. Well, you know what? That's not what God intended. I'm telling, I, I have spent more time than I intended to trying to motivate you that God has more for you and don't limit God. I spent more time doing this than I intended, but I really believe it's directed to the Lord because the average person is just shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. You need to start shooting for the stars. And even if you don't make it, if you miss the stars and hit the moon, that's more than what most people do. You know what, I believe it's, that the Lord is kind of like, you know, when you teach your kid to ride a bike. They try and ride the bike, and usually it doesn't work the very first time. They wobble, they fall over. And instead of you going up and saying, you idiot, you disobeyed me. If you would have done what I said, you would have been able to ride. And instead of criticizing your child, you pick them up and you help them. And you say, hey, you went 10 feet. Try it again. You can do it. And you just encourage them. And eventually, with that encouragement, they get to where they can ride a bike. 
YOU KNOW, I BELIEVE THAT GOD'S LIKE THAT. GOD'S NOT SAYING, YOU IDIOT, HOW COME YOU DIDN'T DO WHAT I TOLD YOU? HE'S ENCOURAGING YOU. AND YOU MAY NOT DO EVERYTHING PERFECTLY, BUT INSTEAD OF THE LORD CONDEMNING YOU, IF YOU STEP OUT, HE'LL ENCOURAGE YOU AND SAY, YOU KNOW WHAT, YOU ACCOMPLISHED MORE THAN YOU WOULD HAVE IF YOU HADN'T BEEN BELIEVING GOD. THERE ARE SOME OF YOU THAT ARE JUST AFRAID TO LEAVE YOUR COMFORT ZONE. EVERYTHING'S FINE AND YOU'RE, you're AFRAID I MIGHT FAIL. BUT GOD IS NOT GOING TO CRITICIZE YOU. MATTER OF FACT, I BELIEVE GOD WOULD SIT THERE AND SAY, IF YOU DON'T TRY, IF YOU DON'T REACH YOUR FULL POTENTIAL, IF YOU DON'T REACH OUT AND DO SOMETHING, THEN YOU'RE GOING TO FAIL. AND YOU KNOW, LET ME JUST PUT IN A PLUG RIGHT HERE THAT I, I MINISTER ALL OVER THROUGH TELEVISION, RADIO, TRAVEL, MINISTER IN CHURCHES AND DO DIFFERENT THINGS. AND I SEE LOTS OF PEOPLE WHEN I MINISTER LIKE THIS THEY DECIDE TO COME TO Karis BIBLE COLLEGE. AND they, THEY DON'T KNOW WHAT THEY'RE CALLED TO DO, BUT THEY JUST KNOW THAT THERE'S SOMETHING MORE. AND THEY COME AND THEY SIT UNDER THE WORD FOR TWO YEARS, AND I TELL YOU, THEY GET DIRECTION, AND THEN THEY GO OUT AND THEIR LIFE IS BETTER THAN IT HAS EVER BEEN. THEY'RE HAPPIER THAN THEY'VE EVER BEEN. I HAD A COUPLE OF OUR STUDENTS JUST TELL ME THIS YESTERDAY, THAT THEY ARE HAPPIER THAN THEY'VE EVER BEEN. THEY ARE MORE CONTENT. THEY KNOW THAT THEY'RE IN THE PERFECT PLACE. AND WE SEE PEOPLE COME AND GET SET FREE LIKE THIS AND THEN GO OUT AND GOD USES THEM IN SUPERNATURAL WAYS. THERE MAY BE SOME OF YOU THAT I'VE STIRRED UP TODAY AND YOU'RE SITTING HERE THINKING, MAN, I NEED TO DO SOMETHING. I DON'T WANT TO BE LIKE THIS MAN THAT JUST TOOK HIS POUND AND HIT IT IN A NAPKIN AND THEN GOT REBUKED BY THE LORD AND HAD, had IT TAKEN AWAY FROM HIM BECAUSE HE HADN'T USED IT FOR ANYTHING. I DON'T WANT TO BE LIKE THAT. I WANT TO MAKE MY LIFE COUNT. I WANT TO DO SOMETHING MORE THAN JUST GET UP AND GO TO WORK AND COME HOME AND WATCH TELEVISION AND GO TO BED AND GET UP AND GO TO WORK AND DO IT ALL OVER AGAIN. I WANT TO HAVE A PURPOSE. AND MANY OF YOU ARE STIRRED, BUT YOU DON'T KNOW WHAT TO DO WITH IT. I'M TELLING YOU, Karis BIBLE COLLEGE WOULD BE THE um, GREAT PLACE FOR YOU TO COME. SOMEBODY SAYS, WELL, I'M NOT SURE IT'S GOD'S WILL. I'D LOVE TO COME, BUT I'M JUST NOT SURE IT'S GOD'S WILL. I'VE HAD PEOPLE COME UP TO ME AND SAY THAT AND SAY, WOULD YOU PLEASE PRAY WITH ME? I WANT TO COME TO SCHOOL, BUT I'M NOT SURE IT'S GOD. I USED TO TRY AND REASON WITH THEM. NOW I JUST SIT THERE AND SAY, WELL, I UNDERSTAND WHAT YOU'RE SAYING. IT MIGHT BE THE DEVIL THAT WANTS YOU TO COME SIT IN BIBLE COLLEGE FOUR HOURS A DAY FOR TWO YEARS. OR it's, MAYBE IT'S YOUR FLESH. MAYBE THIS IS JUST THE WAY THAT YOUR CARNAL PERSON IS. YOU JUST LOVE TO SIT UNDER THE WORD OF GOD. I CAN GUARANTEE YOU, IF YOU HAVE A DESIRE TO BE IN THE BIBLE COLLEGE, IT'S NOT YOUR FLESH. IT'S NOT THE DEVIL. I BELIEVE IT'S GOD. AND WE HAVE A LOT OF WAYS FOR YOU TO GET INVOLVED, NOT ONLY TO COME PHYSICALLY TO THIS CAMPUS, BUT WE HAVE 70-SOMETHING CAMPUSES AROUND THE WORLD. WE HAVE ONLINE SCHOOL. WE HAVE CORRESPONDENT SCHOOL. WE HAVE A HYBRID SCHOOL TO WHERE IT ONLY MEETS TWO DAYS OUT OF A MONTH AND YOU COME ON CAMPUS AND YOU GET THE, the CAMPUS FEEL AND THE INTERACTION OF STUDENTS, BUT THEN YOU DO THE REST THROUGH CORRESPONDENCE, AND WE HAVE PEOPLE THAT DO THAT. WE JUST GOT SO MANY DIFFERENT WAYS THAT WE CAN MINISTER TO YOU THAT THERE'S NOT AN EXCUSE. BUT I WANTED TO ENCOURAGE YOU TODAY THAT, PRAISE GOD, YOU DON'T NEED TO BE LIKE THIS SERVANT THAT TOOK WHAT GOD HAD GAVE HIM AND JUST KEPT IT LAID UP IN A NAPKIN. GOD EXPECTS YOU TO INCREASE. GOD WANTS YOU TO REACH OUT AND ACCOMPLISH SOMETHING, TO DO SOMETHING WITH YOUR LIFE. AND THAT'S WHAT THIS WHOLE TEACHING IS ABOUT. We hope your heart has been quickened by hearing the Word of God through this message. It's the faithful support of people like you who make this ministry possible. We invite you to prayerfully consider becoming a partner with Andrew Womack Ministries. We maintain a website at awmi.net. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111, or you can write us at P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80934. Until next time, we pray that you'll reach out by faith and receive everything that's yours through God's grace.